This is the epic story of the Battle of Crete, one of the most bitter and exciting battles fought between German and Allied forces during the whole of the Second World War. The decisive action took place in May 1941 over five days, and twice its outcome hung in the balance. By the end of the third day, the number of German losses exceeded the total of all losses in all other theaters since the outbreak of hostilities. Yet, despite overwhelming odds, 8,000 men defeated an Allied army nearly five times its strength. These were the brave airborne soldiers of the Fulschermaker. The use of paratroopers began in the Soviet Union. At the 1936 Red Army maneuvers, astonished foreign military attaches watched 1,500 Russian soldiers parachute into action. The British saw little future in this, but the Germans were impressed. Here was a new military skill exactly suited to their new concept of war, Blitzkrieg. No time was wasted in training their own new division of parachute troops. The Fulschermäger was made up from tough, hand-picked volunteers. They used the equally tough and reliable workhorse, the Junkers Ju-52, to drop their soldiers. This machine could carry 12 parachutists who jumped from the aircraft on the port side. The parachutists wore special protective boots, knee pads, overalls, gloves, and helmets. The Luftwaffe Eagle Crest was prominently displayed on the side of these soldiers' helmets. These airborne soldiers were part of the German Air Force, whilst others came under the control of the army. Goring now had his own private army which could balance Himmler's elite Waffen SS. They carried machine pistols with them when they jumped, and all heavier equipment was dropped alongside the troops in metal containers. The parachute used opened automatically and proved efficient. The only drawback was that it held the parachutist on a single harness on his back. This allowed no control at all over the canopy or direction of the drop, and dropped the soldier at an angle which would horrify modern-day parachutists. By the outbreak of war in 1939, the Germans had amalgamated their airborne troops into a crack division of paratroopers under the command of General Major Kurt Studet. The first real major airborne offensive came on the 10th of May 1940, when they landed in Belgium and took the bridges over the Albert Canal and the fortress of Eben Emile. The German parachute troops had also been involved from the beginning of the war. 
they took part in the occupation of Denmark. In Norway, they also fought heroically. And it was here that the parachute troops won their first night's cross. In early 1941, Hitler came up with his plan to invade Russia. In order to secure his southern flanks, he managed to coerce most of the Balkan states onto his side. But at the end of March, with the military coup d'etat, the Yugoslavians decided to break ranks. A furious Hitler invaded Yugoslavia and Greece on the 6th of April, 1941. It was a classic blitzkrieg campaign, swift and decisive. The Yugoslav forces were ill-prepared to face such an onslaught and were quickly overrun. The Germans entered the capital, Belgrade, on the 12th of April, and Yugoslavia surrendered five days later. Greece held out a little longer, but the British contingent were forced back and had to be evacuated by the Royal Navy. German paratroopers were brought in to try and cut off the escaping British. One of the remaining strongholds was the Corinth Canal, the small bridges there constituting the sole line of communication between the Peloponnese and mainland Greece. On the 26th of April, German paratroopers jumped well in advance of the army and after a fierce battle took the canal and the city of Corinth. The British had been driven from the mainland, but still occupied the island of Crete. It was important for Germany to take Crete. Apart from its strategic position in the Mediterranean, it also provided close proximity for the British bombers, enabling them to be in range of the Ploesti oil fields in Romania. These were vital to Germany's war machine, and needed to be protected at all costs. Likewise, German-Italian shipping routes 
routes throughout the Mediterranean were also under threat from the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy. The mountain ranges of southern Crete are very steep and run down into the sea, so most of the towns, the roads between them and the military airfields lay on the northern coastline. Major General Freiburg, who brought the New Zealand Division to Crete from Greece, was appointed as commander of the entire Crete garrison. He had been warned to expect the enemy to land both from the sea and the air. He also believed that the Germans would be able to land their transport aircraft on rough ground. Although he included the airfields in his defence plan, he did not realise that in the event, these four positions would become the only vital points of the assault on the island. The garrison consisted of a United Kingdom brigade and a Royal Marine unit, reasonably well equipped and fresh. These were reinforced by Commonwealth and Greek forces recently withdrawn from Greece. These, however, were tired and without heavy equipment or transport. But the bulk of the force making up the strength of the garrison were ready and equipped to put up a strong fight. In total, there were almost 40,000 troops under Freiburg's command. They had motorized transport and heavy guns. Extra supplies to defend the garrison were also brought in by sea. The British were ready to defend the island at all costs. They knew full well that in German hands, Crete would be very dangerous for their position in North Africa and the Mediterranean. There were also a number of aircraft of the Royal Air Force. Freiburg also had at his disposal small tanks and armored personnel carriers. Germans were on the move. The troops were being transported south through the Balkans, ready for the invasion. At sea, a small armada of commandeered Italian shipping was being prepared to carry over the heavy equipment and support troops to the invasion. These were supported by the bombers of the Luftwaffe and naval destroyers. In Greece, the paratroopers were preparing. The aircraft were being made ready for the assault and supplies were loaded, including motorcycles. The mixed staff of naval, air and army officers, including General Student, conferred over aerial photographs planning the final strategy. Student spent much of his time with his paratroopers. The plan was that they would attack in two separate waves. The first group would attack the airfield at Malem and the area around the town of Kanea, which was believed to be the garrison headquarters. The second wave would follow, six hours later, and attack the airfields and landing grounds at Araklion and Retima. The brave intention being to jump at different points into the midst of a vastly superior enemy and sever their main points, thus paralyzing their movements. As the paratroopers listened to broadcasts from the German high command, they were wrongly advised that the enemy they were about to face were disorganized, and following their demoralizing defeat on the Greek mainland, lacked the necessary equipment and will to fight. In this overconfidence, they were gravely mistaken. The orders to attack were transmitted from the general headquarters and were sent by dispatch rider to the airfields of the waiting parachute commands.
preceding the first wave was a heavy attack on the island from the Luftwaffe's dive bombers. Throughout the first day, there were to be continuous bombing and strafing attacks on all strategic parts of Crete with a heavy concentration on the airfields. These airfields were irreparably pitted with bomb craters and almost all of British fighters were destroyed on the ground. The plan was that once these airfields had been put out of action, the first wave of paratroopers would attack. The capture of Malim in the northeast corner of Crete with its 600 meter runway was vital to the success of the whole operation. To the east lay Canea, General Freiburg's headquarters, and also the island's main garrison, defended by a New Zealand regiment. Just after dawn on the morning of the 20th of May, 1941, the first of the Junkers Ju-52s prepared to take off. As the 12 paratroopers boarded their aircraft, there was an air of apprehension. Contrary to their brief and what they assumed to be an ill-prepared enemy, they were about to face an allied force which outnumbered them five to one, and one which was ready and waiting to fight a hard and ferocious battle. As the signal is given for the first wave to take off, the aircraft lumber down the runway. This was the start of an airborne legend. For the first time in history, an island, and moreover a strongly fortified and heavily defended one, was about to fall to an airborne assault. The first group of 90 men, led by Lieutenant Gentz, landed in a hail of gunfire at approximately 0700 hours. Despite heavy casualties, they succeeded in knocking out the anti-aircraft positions south of the Malim airfield. They were followed by another force led by Major Koch, whose orders were to consolidate and then launch an attack on the airfield itself. The sky was awash with hundreds of white parachutes. However, things soon started to go wrong. One company landed as planned, but the two other companies were blown off course and consequently landed in the middle of a strong British position. Major Koch was wounded within minutes, along with over half of his men. The planned assault on the airfield was impossible under such conditions. However, the other company managed to fight their way to the western perimeter of the airfield and succeeded in securing the western and southern perimeter defences. The next company dropped into an area northeast of the airfield and were initially unable to consolidate. Scattered all over, they came under heavy fire from a hill known as Point 107. 
Another group, under the command of General Major Mindel, successfully landed in the vicinity to the west of the airfield. But Mindel was seriously wounded as the force came under heavy fire from the British. It was impossible to secure the airfield. The paratroopers were having enough trouble securing their own positions. And to compound the problem, a counterattack from the British was expected at any time. Obest Heydrich's group dropped onto an area west of Canea. Its task was to capture the towns of Canea, Galatas, and the positions around the Suda Bay. Major Heilman's battalion parachuted into the middle of a surprise but very determined force of New Zealanders and met with fierce opposition. Another company, the 9th, landed on the planned position. Unfortunately, others dropped onto mountains and some even dropped into a large reservoir, resulting in many paratroopers drowning. The fighting around the town of Galatas was a fierce and bloody struggle which went on for the remainder of the day with no significant ground gain. Another battalion dropped near the Agia prison, a useful strong point from which they could control the main road from Heraklion to Canea. They landed near their target, but immediately came under heavy fire. After a long struggle, they did manage to secure the prison and turned it into the regimental headquarters. The paratroopers now had a stronghold, but still were unable to make any headway towards Canea. Practically everything had gone wrong with the first wave, none of their prime objectives had been secured, and several battalion and company commanders had been killed or wounded. On the Greek mainland, however, nothing of this was known. But the second wave had also encountered problems. The time planned to reload and refuel the returning aircraft was too short. They had to be refueled by hand from jerry cans. This would mean that the second wave would have to take off in small groups rather than en masse. Student had realized beforehand that his plan to take all key positions in the first day had been ambitious to say the least. His troops would be scattered over a large area, and splitting the second wave into small groups only compounded the risk. Unaware of the failures of the first wave, Student and the other officers in the high command went ahead as planned. The second wave was to hit the airfields of Retimo and Heraklion. The first groups took off at 13.30 hours en route to Retimo.
By now, reports were coming back to the High Command from the Luftwaffe, and it soon became apparent that things were not going as planned for the first wave. Student later wrote in his report in what can only be described as an understatement. It was obvious that the British were tougher and much stronger than we thought, but at that moment there was nothing we could do but hold our breath and leave the conduct of the battle to the commanders on the ground. Would the resistance at Grotimo and Heraklion be as fierce as that around Malim and Kenea? The second wave was now airborne. As they approached the coast of Crete, a handful of British fighters were there to repel them, but resistance was light and the Junkers Ju-52s forged ahead. The first two companies dropped on Rotimo as planned were immediately pinned down by heavy fire. The third company landed some five miles away and succeeded in capturing a hill overlooking Retimo airfield. The group attacking Heraklion found the area heavily defended, so they had to fly in higher than usual. And as a result, many of the paratroopers were machine gunned in the air during their descent. Other units were widely dispersed it was clear that there was no hope of taking either objective by the end of the first day. They had now dropped onto all four planned zones, but it was here that General Freiburg made a mistake. He did not counter-attack. This gave the German troops a chance to consolidate and prepare for a second offensive. The next morning saw a heavy attack by the Luftwaffe, concentrated around Malim airfield. Although the Battle of Crete was still hanging in the balance, the Allies, by not attacking the German forces during the night whilst they were scattered and disorganized, had lost their best opportunity. By counter-attacking in force, they could have swept the Germans into the sea. Now it was too late. Whilst the attack came from the air, the paratroopers on the ground at Malim managed to capture two heavy guns and turned them on the Allies. By 1400 hours, two more companies had landed at Malim, and before long the whole area around the airfield became a massive battlefield, each side gaining ground. After a hard fight, the airfield defences were finally overrun and the German forces had cleared the path to land further forces and reinforcements. By 1500 hours, the Ju-52s began landing, and with them came fresh troops and heavy artillery. Despite the fact that new fresh troops were arriving, all was not well. At sea, two convoys of small, commandeered Italian craft carrying two battalions of troops to Crete had been met and engaged by the Royal Navy. The convoys were sunk. Only 51 men and one officer survived. On Crete, losses were also running high. Some of the aircraft had been shot up before managing to land, leaving only the dead and wounded inside. Fierce resistance from the Allied forces were taking a heavy toll on German casualties. One complete battalion, save only five survivors, had been wiped out in one battle alone. The seriously wounded were being sent back to the mainland in the Junkers, which had landed with fresh troops. Almost 40% of students' initial assault force in the first two waves were now dead, wounded, or being held captive. But as reinforcements came in, it appeared that the worst phase of the battle was over. A 
Unbeknown to the Germans, General Freiburg had secured a copy of the campaign plan. This document was of immense importance, for not only did it indicate the strength and intended direction of the enemy thrusts, their order of battle, armament and supply positions, but it was also plain from the document that the Germans had grossly underestimated the strength of the Allies and also indicated that they had committed virtually the whole of their airborne force. When May the 22nd dawned, the worst phase of the battle was over for the Germans. However, this was not apparent to Hitler and his advisers, who were dismayed at the losses and would not allow any mention of the Creek landings in the press or on the radio. The deployment of new troops and reinforcements continued regardless of the fierce resistance from Allied troops all over the island. The new divisional commander, General Major Ringel, had been brought in to assume command of all forces in the Malim area, organizing his scattered forces into three battle groups. Kamp Group Saita was to protect the Malim area from any threat from the west and push towards capturing Castelli. The second group, under Obertz Ramke, was to strike northwards to the sea and protect the airfield, and then extend eastward along the coast. And the third group, under Oberst Utz, was to move eastward into the mainland with a flanking movement through the mountains. Throughout the day, troops and supplies continued to be flown in. Some aircraft even began to make the precarious flight over enemy territory to bring much needed food, water and medical supplies to the small pockets of men on the ground. Unable to move and pinned down by Allied defences, some of these small groups had been without food and water for over 24 hours and ammunition was running short. Near Araklion, one regiment had found itself pinned down by an Allied force of over 8,000 men. Despite being desperately short of supplies and facing overwhelming odds, including heavy artillery, Major Schulz, commanding the regiment, refused an offer by the British to surrender, stating, The German army have been ordered to take the island of Crete. It will carry out this order. On the west of the island, one battalion had progressed towards Castelli and reported hard fighting against armed civilians. These partisans had carried out frightful atrocities on the wounded and dead Germans. 135 out of 550 had been mutilated beyond recognition. Throughout a day of concentrating and regrouping the various pockets of scattered paratroops in Gurupa West Sector, supplies were brought forward and fresh troops were landed on the island at Malim. Every hour, about 20 aircraft came in, some of them carrying troops. Some of them carried artillery, whilst others carried anti-tank guns and heavy equipment. They landed amidst heavy artillery fire from the Allies and the surrounding hills. However, during this fourth day of the battle, the New Zealand force, which had been covering the airfield from camouflage positions, had come under counterattack from the Germans. This resulted in a break in their flank, which left them with no alternative other than to withdraw from the area before they were completely cut off. As a result, Malim was no longer dominated by their fire, and the airstrip was now completely secured. Malim was undoubtedly the saving grace for the Germans, although it had cost them dearly, for without this precious airstrip, success would have been impossible.
The Germans were now pushing south to reinforce the group under Aubert's Utz. The second force of two companies worked its way towards the south coast to strike and secure the town of Palio Or. Operation Mercury, as it was codenamed by the German High Command, was beginning to gather momentum. With more and more troops being airlifted in at Malim, hour after hour, General Major Ringel was able to regroup. One group attacked Galatas, while another was given the task of marching 50 miles across the mountains to the south in a flanking movement to secure the Canea Retimo road east of Suda Bay. Obes Krakow was to lead this formation of men who had been brought in that morning. On May the 24th in Germany, News was released that German paratroopers had been battling against part of the British army on the island of Crete since the early morning of May the 20th, a sign that Hitler was beginning to feel confident in the success of the operation. Around the town of Galatas, southwest of Canea, fierce fighting raged between mountain troops and New Zealanders. With the help of the Luftwaffe bombarding the defences from the air, the German troops succeeded in forcing their way into the village. On the morning of the 25th, Obest Heydrich's paratroops, surrounded in what was known as Prison Valley since their landing on the morning of the 20th, came into contact with fresh reinforcements. They attacked the area around the town of Castelli. Thrust and counter-thrust was accentuated by the crashing sound of artillery shells and the scream of the Stukas overhead. At Heraklion, the Luftwaffe's Dorniers bombarded the town in a bid to relieve the paratroops that had been dug in there since the 20th of May. The British had been trying to bring in supplies and reinforcements by sea, but the bombers prevented those ships from docking. On May the 27th, Freiburg sent the message back to Britain. No matter what decision is taken by the Commander-in-Chief, from a military point of view, our position here is hopeless. Our force cannot stand up to the concentrated bombing that we've been faced with for the past six days. I feel a certain part of the force should therefore be embarked. As British soldiers were taken prisoner, further German reinforcements were still pouring in by air and sea to cut off the retreating British. On May the 27th, the British gave the order to evacuate the island and the troops started to withdraw southwards. General Major Ringel failed to recognize the retreat and threw his troops into an attack on Canea.
By late afternoon, despite counterattacks by the New Zealand and Australian forces, the Germans had penetrated the town and Kanea and Suda Bay fell into German hands. At Heraklion, things were different. The airfield had still not been taken. This Junkers has been shot up whilst attempting to land, and we can see the aircraft coming in with only one wheel. A lucky escape for those on board. Further south, Camp Grupa Krakow had toiled through the mountains to outflank the British west of Stilos. Within a few hours of heavy fighting, they had control of the road which led south. By May the 28th, the evacuation of the Allies had begun, and there followed a steady stream of Royal Naval vessels taking the troops off the island. The Germans moved west and then took the road south to meet the retreating Allies in a bid to cut them off. There was fierce fighting, but the Allies managed to hold off the German advance, allowing the Royal Navy time to make several return journeys to get their troops off. They managed to get nearly 15,000 men to Egypt, but the passage had cost the British Mediterranean fleet dearly from the attacks by the Luftwaffe. The island of Crete was now about to be completely overrun. By May the 30th, the whole of Crete, except the port of Sfakia, was in German hands and pockets of the Allied troops were being rounded up. Malim, Kanea, Suda Bay, Retimo and Heraklion had all fallen to the invaders, and when the German troops entered the towns, they found very little resistance. When May the 31st dawned, the Royal Navy had by then taken off thousands of Allied troops. That evening, General Freiburg left the island. His job was over. The order for capitulation the next day had been given. The island of Crete had fallen. At 0900 hours on June the 1st, 1941, the remaining British, Australian, New Zealand and Greek troops surrendered to the Germans. 7,000 British, 3,000 Australians and 4,500 New Zealanders had been evacuated to Egypt, but 11,835 men had been taken prisoner as the island capitulated. Over the course of the battle, 1,742 British and Dominion soldiers had been killed. A further 1,737 had been wounded. 
the Royal Navy had also suffered heavy losses. In trying to rescue the men, one aircraft carrier, six cruisers and nine battleships were badly damaged, and three cruisers and six destroyers had been sunk. Just over 2,000 men had been lost at sea, and a further 500 had been wounded. The number of Greek troops and civilian casualties has never been precisely established. Of the troops that were left on the island, some managed to make their own escape and headed into the hills. Others found abandoned landing barges or fishing craft. Although no accurate figure is recorded, it is believed that several hundred men made their own escape from the island. For the people of Crete, there now followed the horrors and turmoil of occupation under the Nazis. Any Cretan found harboring an allied soldier was severely punished. And in some cases, when the Gestapo and the SS began a later and thorough search of the island, the villagers offering shelter to those that had escaped were shot. As for the German garrison on Crete, it found itself somewhat out on a limb. It was too far from North Africa to affect the war there, and, more importantly, it did not prevent the United States Air Force from bombing the Ploesti oil fields on two separate occasions. Was Operation Mercury a success for the Germans? Or was it a phony victory? In all, 10,000 paratroops had been sent in by parachute, 750 came in gliders, a further 5,000 had been brought in by air transport, and 6,000 had been brought in by sea. Of the 22,000 or so men committed to the battle, a staggering 6,000 had been killed. Among the casualties were some of the key men in the German airborne force. General Major Sussmann, Major Braun, Major Scherber, Oberlieutenant von Plessen, all had died in the fight for the island. Out of the 500 transport aircraft, 271 had been lost. In the words of Winston Churchill, the very spearhead of the German lance has been shattered. When Hitler, who had taken a considerable interest in the airborne forces right from the early days, heard of the losses, he was sufficiently perturbed. So much so that he told the paratroops commander, General Major Student, the day of the paratrooper is over. The parachute arm is a surprise weapon and without the element of surprise there can be no future for airborne forces. After the battle for Crete, there was never to be another large-scale German airborne operation. Despite the Pyrrhic victory of Crete and the fact that there were so many losses, there can be no doubt as to the valor of the men that undertook the operation. They had taken part in history's first and still only successful purely airborne operation. They could be proud, and justly so, of their achievement in taking on a force five times their own strength.
General Major Student praised his paratroopers at their victory parade in Athens by stating, Our victory banners wave over Crete. You, my paratroopers and airborne troops, have, under your proven leaders, achieved unprecedented feats. Paratroopers, filled with an unstoppable offensive spirit, you, entirely on your own, defeated the numerically superior enemy in an heroic, bitter struggle. Wherever you landed on Crete, you both stormed heroically and held stubbornly.